Good morning. Today is uh, Sunday, December 4th. Um, let us um, set our intentions, make aspirations by saying the Four Immeasurables Prayer. May all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings not be separated from the happiness that has never known suffering. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment, anger, and aversion. Um, uh, I'm going to read a, a little teaching from Khandro Rinpoche, who uh, I really recommend uh, if these teachings interest you to look her up. She has a lot of teachings on YouTube. K-H-A-N-D-R-O Rinpoche. Um, I think she's one of the most um, important teachers and minds of this time, really, to be honest. Um, you can find a lot of teachings by her. You could find, uh, she has several centers in different parts of the world. You can see when she's going to be teaching in person. You could see when she's going to be teaching by Zoom online. Um, you could see where her, her sanghas are, which part of the world, and maybe be part of that even if she's not present at the moment. Um, but uh, she just is amazingly brilliant. And um, well, I will read what I wanted to share. And I found this on a... Instagram page called Jang Chub Norbu, J A G, sorry, J A N G C H U B dot Norbu, N O R B U. Jang Chub dot Norbu. Compassion is not about kindness, compassion is about awareness. Those two sentences are very important. Let's really pay attention to those. I'm going to read them again. Compassion is not about kindness. Compassion is about awareness. Compassion, in the general sense of kindness, would be an expression of awareness. But one that might not be necessarily free from the stain of ego grasping. He's talking about compassion in the general sense. Genuine compassion is egoless. It is the inherent essence expressed, inseparable from awareness. This natural essence, which is genuine compassion, does not need to be formulated or even expressed as something like compassion. We see this exemplified in our great teachers. Their genuine compassion does not require phrases and expressions or even actions, just their presence, who they are, is nothing other than the quintessence of compassion. So she here is equating compassion as awareness, being awareness, inseparable from awareness, the same as awareness. Awareness is what we talk about here, what we cultivate in meditation. We don't, we're not cultivating meditation. We're, we're actually kind of cultivating and familiarizing ourselves with awareness. And when we talk about awareness, we're not talking about an intellectual concept, right? that level of awareness when we really kind of settle into our meditation is that same thing we talk about that clear open wide limitless blue sky right there's nothing intellectual about that when we really settle into it there's nothing to dissect there's nothing to analyze there's really not there's 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 just a settling into it the same for awareness Awareness is not an intellectual experience uh, because we're not talking about qualifying it, quantifying it, measuring it, justifying it, relating it. Because once concept goes into our awareness, then we're involved in concept. Then we're involved in the intellect. Then we're 
involved in projection, duality, us and them, me and you, you know what I mean. Uh, then we have to use our intellect. And sometimes I'm not saying intellect is bad or wrong. You know, intellect can, if we apply teachings intellectually, there is obviously certain things that uh, can be achieved that are good, you know, certain disciplines, ethical disciplines, um, avoiding negative behaviors, you know, by, by our, you know, discriminating mind. But she's talking about compassion being more related to that, if I'm interpreting this correctly, non-conceptual, non-intellectual experience of awareness. So then what is compassion? Because we always think of compassion, often we think of compassion as a sense of pity, you know. I have compassion for this person because they're suffering. I see these people starving in this country on the news and it makes me feel bad for them. I have compassion for them. I wish I could uh, do something to help them. Not saying, again, this concept is bad or wrong, not by any means. But if we are experiencing this compassion through our intellect, then it's going to be subject to you know the limitations of our own ego because, you know, we are not, we have not transcended the ego, you know, we're not Buddhas, we're not Bodhisattvas, you know, um, we're not the, you know, uh, the Lamas, you know, who have achieved this kind of equanimity and realizations. So how do we handle this? What do we, what, you know, what, how do we make sense of this compassion being awareness, compassion not being this conceptual uh, conceptual, mental, intellectual activity. Uh, I, I think I read a quote a couple of weeks ago saying, what is not an intellectual experience cannot be experienced by the intellect. All right. So this experience of awareness really is using meditation as a method to get to this taste to taste awareness. You know, because we can't through the intellect say, this is not awareness, this is not awareness, this is awareness. We have to kind of experience it. And we use meditation as a method to get there. So if it's not a intellectual experience, what is it? And how does it relate? How is it awareness? How does it relate? What is that interconnectedness? You know, and then many ways what she's saying is you know when your awareness uh is present when you're dropped into that level of awareness that inner radiance that is inherent within it uh is natural true compassion without concept without saying this person deserves my pity this person deserves my compassion. This person does not because he's a bad person. I shouldn't feel bad for this person who's suffering because he brought that on himself or he's done so many bad things to other people. He deserves that and I shouldn't feel, you know, there's, you know, our, our ego and our intellect's going to measure what we, who we feel is deserving of compassion or not. Again, I'm not saying that intellectual compassion necessarily is wrong or bad. It can often inspire us to do things that are very important and very beneficial to the world. Like, you know, you see people who are homeless in your neighborhood and you want to volunteer to help them or something like that. That's a very beneficial activity, you know, that uh, that can help people. Um, is there an element of compassion in that? Yes. Real compassion, like she's talking about, yes, because inherently we have Buddha nature. Uh, so it's not without that. But she's talking about kind of almost the, the taint that ego brings to this real, uh, that pure compassion that she's talking about. That's really inseparable from awareness. That's really inseparable from emptiness, from shunyata, is what we're really talking about. So what do we do about this? You know, um, I'm not saying stop being, you know, stop 
thinking about the world in terms of compassion and having compassion for people. I think we have to attack things often from both ways. Yeah, we have to use our intellect. Our intellect is, is a very powerful tool and can do amazing things. And, and it's good to direct that intellectual energy towards things that are constructive, towards things that are more altruistic, uh, towards things that are a uh, benefit to others, not just ourselves. At the same time, we're cultivating awareness that non-conceptuality and understanding, even if, if now it is conceptual, the fact that, you know, the true nature of reality is uh, interdependence, impermanence, uh, uncompounded, non-dual, you know. Again, so what do we do with this? So when we sit and take our seat and when we meditate, If we have a level of confidence in this action, if we have a level of, I don't want to say pride, because that can get into arrogance or something like that, but a sense of purpose that taking this seat in meditation, that, that, that committing to, uh, to cultivating awareness. And if you are using a method like the teaching Dharma, Buddha Dharma and meditation to cultivate awareness, uh, that you're also cultivating true compassion. To not look at it as something, well, when I'm enlightened, I'll get there. Or when I, you know, when I've been studying for 20 years, I'll get there. Or when I get into the cave and can really give up all my worldly activities and meditate and do nothing but meditate for three years, then I'll get there. You know, no, to say that uh, I have confidence that I have Buddha nature. And that is just a matter of practice, study, clearing out obscurations of karma, eons of karma or years of karma, however you want to look at it. Uh, and, and I will direct efforts towards getting to know this Buddha nature, or letting this Buddha nature shine unimpededly somehow. And, and how this can help us is that it can further our examination of compassion in action, you know. So when we feel compassion or when we're inspired to act of, out of compassion, you know, we can take another step, a step further and look at it and say, I'm using my logic uh, to discern that compassion is is a necessary feeling here, thought towards this this person, you know. Uh, but at the same time, there's also this inner Buddha nature radiance of awareness that really has true compassion, and and to somehow have that knowledge at the same time could be very helpful. And I guess also what she's saying is true compassion is without subject or object, right? We always have compassion towards uh, someone, towards something else, towards a situation, but it's we that's having it towards the object. It's subject having it to the object. And I think she's saying something that true compassion, like Buddha nature, is without subject and object. It's more of just like a radiance, you know? It's more that that level of awareness that's just radiating Buddha nature, which of course has karma, uh, which of course has uh, compassion. Right? Something to keep in mind. Right? Something that's not going to be, uh, you know. And we use our intellect to have this discussion, you know. To communicate these things. Um, but basically what I'm saying is when we sit and practice, you know, and when you have these, these tastes and these moments where you feel your awareness is, you know, pulsating, emanating, you know, that, that, that's, that compassion is there as well. I think that can help. 
And just hearing the words of the teachers, of the lamas, you know, of the bodhisattvas, um, plant seeds. And we may not be able to really fully understand these things, let alone uh, actualize them and realize them. But, but they plant seeds and give us direction, direction in our practice, you know. Um, and I really, really encourage you to, uh, I don't know, I would devour her teachings if I were you. <laughs> I don't usually say that, but um, it's, she's quite remarkable. There's a lot of teachings of hers on, on YouTube, and they're just wonderful. And she's so uh, uh, articulate and... Um, you know, watching her, a teacher like that, you you really see the living embodiment of the teachings, you know, and just the way she teaches and the way she communicates, and it's quite inspiring. So I encourage you to, um, you know, it's easy, there's nothing easier, right, than switching on your computer and Googling Khandra Rinpoche and clicking on a teaching. I mean, you can do it from, your, you know, the comfort of your couch or bed or desk. So, uh, with that in mind, you know, let's uh, meditate. We're going to end right at 11 today. Uh, so, um, we'll meditate a bit and then we'll take some questions if you have any and if we can answer any. Um, let's, try, let's go with the nine purifying breaths. That's a good way to, um, you know, because we're not just working with the mind. We're working, you know, so we have a body and we have to deal with the body in order to uh, exist um, and the same with meditation practice, we're dealing with the breath, we're dealing with the posture, you know, we're settling into our seat in a cushion, on a cushion, if you need one, keep the hips above the knees, or level with the knees, back is straight, we're going to take, we make the Vajra fist, we tuck our thumb to the ring finger, close, do that on both hands, First, we take uh, the index finger on the right hand, closing off the left nostril. We're going to breathe into the right channel, which in men is usually white. Women, it's red. The white channel deals with anger uh, as a poison and its antidote. Patience, loving kindness. Um, and we'll breathe fresh, pure air into that channel. Switch, close off the right. We're going to breathe out of the red channel if you're uh, a man. A white if you're a woman. Red channel deals with attachment, the loss, desire, greed, those things. Generosity uh, being the an antidote. Also love, you know. Breathe out. Whatever kind of unpurified air energy is coming out. Switch, do it again. Remember the three channels meet, the central channel is blue at the navel. Keep that image in mind. Goes up the back, comes over your head and out here. Now we'll switch. The Vajra fist put on your knees. We're going to breathe through both nostrils into the central channel. The blue channel, which deals with ignorance. Ignorance being, uh, you know, the obscurations towards knowing the true nature of reality. True nature of us. Hold and breathe out. And breathing in wisdom. On the third outbreath, we're going to imagine ejecting through the crown chakra, merging our consciousness with space, 
forceful breath. <clears throat> Take that into meditation. Rest in the natural great peace that is our true nature. If you have a thought, which you probably will, I'm pretty sure you will. Just become aware of the fact that you're thinking. Don't push it away. Don't reject it. Don't judge it. Don't follow it. Don't elaborate on it. Just become aware. Go back to the breath. Focus on the space between your upper lip and nostrils. Focus on the air moving through there. Or use the visualization technique of the cloud arising in the limitless, clear, stainless, infinite blue sky. That is the true nature of mind. The cloud is the cloud is the thought that has arisen within the mind, and watch it dissolve back into it, leaving no trace. And then back to the breath. Those of you who have been doing it a little longer, we've talked a little bit about the concept of mind looking at mind. Awareness, being aware of what is happening in the mind. And sometimes just by utilizing that awareness, seeing that a thought has arisen, we can recognize that thought and liberate it just through recognizing it and letting it go without a visualization per se, without readjusting our attention back to the breath or a place where we're breathing, but just letting awareness liberate itself in a way. So in that way, the thoughts become your friend because they allow you to go into awareness. They remind you that there's awareness to be tended to, to relax into, to let emerge. And if that awareness without the story, without the thought, without the emotional quality of the thought, that awareness, that just resting wide open space. If you're able to get a glimpse or a taste of that, you can have confidence that true compassion is inextricable from it, intertwined, inter, uh, arising at the same time, inseparable. Back to the breath.
Recognize the fact that you're thinking. Use the technique. Go back to the breath. Space between the nostrils and upper lip. Focus your attention there. Or just see that. See the thought as like a cloud that has arisen. Watch it dissolve. Ahem. <clears throat> How about the concept that we must not interfere with another person's karma? To interfere with another's karma, then it becomes our karma. Um, well, I'm not really sure about that question because, you know, we're social beings. I mean, unless you live isolated uh, away from every other person, you're going to be interacting and that, uh, interfering is kind of putting a certain label on it because, um, that's a negative label, interference, getting in the way of someone else's karma, which you can't really do. You're going to interact with other beings. That's just the nature of our existence. And if you are, then part of their karma is that they're interacting with you and you're interacting with them. Um, must not also is a, there, there, there's no Buddhist teaching that says you must not interfere with someone else's karma. That's not a, that's not a Buddhist concept. Um, uh, you, you will be uh, interacting with other people. And if you're interacting with other people, you, you know, the, then you have a shared karma of that interaction. Um, I think basically what you just said is just not do harm. That's kind of a better way to look at that concept. Right. I'm not really sure. Uh, I'm not really sure if I cannot really elaborate on that. Um, you know, what we're trying to do through studying Buddha Dharma, through meditation, through cultivating awareness, is to have more positive ways of interacting with others. So it's not, uh, so our interaction, what we're putting out, what we're giving out, you know, to others and to the world is not so tainted by our own poisons, you know, with negative emotions. I hope that's clear. If it's not, you know, write back. Oh, Khandro Rinpoche is the teacher I was talking about. K-H-A-N-D-R-O Rinpoche. R-I-N-P-O-C-H-E. 
I have never been spiritual, but recently went through some serious mental health issues and found plant medicine. And here I am meditating. Do you feel psychedelic assisted therapy has any place in society? Um, probably. I mean, uh, a medical and psychiatric professionals do. Some of them do. Uh, so I would imagine they've done sufficient study and testing to verify that. Um, I have no experience in that, so I can't address it. I have no experience on how that relates to pra to meditation practice. But I think that's something uh, you say psychedelic assisted therapy. You need to talk to a professional about that. And uh, if that's something you want to investigate, I, I don't know. But I don't know anything about that, nor have I really heard it discussed from Buddhist teachers. I, I've never heard it really recommended. I've never heard it necessarily been discour you know, discouraged. Uh, how important is it to think about the specific channels and what they represent? I asked because for some reason I can never remember which, what means what. Um, you know, do your best, you know, keep practicing. It's because you're doing, we're doing a couple of things at the same time. We're imagining, you know, we're sitting in a meditation posture, we're working with our breasts, we're imagining these channels that we can't see that we don't know about. But your name is uh, George. All right, I'm going to make an assumption that you're male. You might not be if you're not, you know, forgive me, but uh, I would, you know, your channels may correspond to mine, how I envision mine. So the right channel is white. The left is red, the center is blue, and the right deals with um, the negative emotion of anger, which is a very prevalent one in our being, in our society, and all these things, right? So when you breathe into that channel, you're breathing the antidote to anger, if you will, like patience, you know? Or you know, anger can be hatred as well, or you're breathing in compassion. Imagine it like that. The red is like attachment. That could be lust, that could be desire, that could be ambition, that could be um, grasping for things, you know what I mean? Um, ego grasping, all that kind of thing. And the opposite would, would, you know, you think of generosity, humility, kindness, and all that, breathing that in. And then the central channel, uh, the poison of ignorance, which is, you know, not understanding the truth, meaning just thinking of yourself as some material being who just is here to eat, sleep, and, you know, defecate and dominate or whatever, as opposed to being, you know, part of the universal oneness, you know, who has Buddha nature. So when you're breathing in, you're breathing in that wisdom, you know, that knows the nature of mind and the nature, our true nature of being, and you're breathing out that ignorance. You can also Google Buddhist, um, uh, you know, energetic, Buddhist um, internal channels or something, you know, and see an internal diagram. That could help, you know. I told my 12-year-old to practice awareness, making an effort towards kindness all the time, being aware to, to be compassionate and gentle. Recommend any resources to reinforce this for adolescents. I don't know offhand any. I'm sure there are good ones. Go to Shambhala or Wisdom Publications websites and, 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 and do some searches for books for uh, teens, adolescents. I'm sure there's some good ones because those are two really good uh, publishers of Buddhist literature, Buddhist um, teachings, Shambhala and Wisdom Publications. I was taught that ultimately our true nature is genderless and that all people are capable of achieving enlightenment. Yet it seems that Khandra Rinpoche is one of the few renowned female Tibetan teachers and Buddhist nuns often don't get the same opportunities as monks. That is uh, true. That's changing. Uh, the, the, the Karmapa, who's one of the, who's the kind of main highest lama in the Kagyu tradition of Buddhism is someone who's really made great efforts to talk about um, uh, just taking away any kind of limitations regarding 
monks and nuns and gender and things like that. You know, uh, not all of Buddhism is institutional. You have to understand that, right? In the Kagyu lineage of which we're a part of, right? The first human teacher, they say, of the Kagyu lineage is uh, Talopa, who was a yogi, who was not a, mo a monk, who was not part of a monastery, who was not part of any kind of institutional Buddhism. Uh, so there's that tradition of the yogi that has no, div you know, that has no division between male and female and monks and nuns and is in any kind of institution or anything like that. Um, in Buddhism evolved in many different countries, mostly in Asia, you know, or, or originally, in the, at least in the first 2000 years of it. Um, and the teachings took on the flavors of the culture some aspects of those cultures uh, were rooted in, you know, patriarchy. Um, that was really, really steeped in the, in, in the culture and that transferred to the institution that Buddhism was taught in or practiced in. That is not to say that individual practitioners of Buddhism, whether or not they were monks or lay people or nuns or lay people, were all, that does not uh, assume that they also were steeped necessarily in a patriarchal system because monasteries in many places in Asia were uh, kind of see, mini seats of government sometimes. Um, there's nothing in the teachings that uh, really discusses this, you know, that really when you, you know, the true nature of the teachings has no difference in uh, gender capability of achieving enlightenment or being a better practitioner, you know, these are things that, um, remember, not just because someone is a monk or someone runs a monastery doesn't mean they're enlightened beings and have transcended all their own limitations and stuff like that. So, uh, I think now that, you know, the modern world uh, has really made great efforts to go past, you know, the patriarchal systems that have evolved when, you know, we're not there yet, but there's a lot more, um, you know, awareness about it. And uh, there's a lot more movements in our societies towards transcending that I think we'll see a lot more um, great uh, Buddhist teachers. I hope that uh, helps. Is awareness a form of creating your destiny or recognizing your destiny? Um, Buddhism doesn't really talk about destiny. Uh, karma is not preordination. Karma is really action and reaction. It's not, you know, when you talk about eh, it's my car, if I talk about it's my karma to be sitting here on a Sunday talking about meditation and you know answer you know trying to answer some questions people have it's my karma to do that that doesn't mean it was my destiny to do that that means causes and conditions and actions that I have taken um, among those causes and conditions have led me here it wasn't like when I was ten someone could have said he's preordained to be sitting in this position. No, there were a lot of causes and conditions and things that happened along the way, decisions that I made and things that pushed me this way or that way that led me here. Um, and awareness Uh, I think what you're asking also is how does awareness affect karma? You know, and obviously walking some kind of spiritual path, Buddhism, for example, which we talk about here. Um, hopefully, 
it will decrease our negative actions and increase our positive actions and help us cultivate awareness. That's basically Buddhism in a nutshell, right? Do no harm, cultivate virtue, cultivate virtuous activities and tame the mind. So cultivating awareness allows more discerning awareness, right? Knowing, knowing understanding. I'm talking about awareness on a more kind of logical way, intellectual way, not just that radiant awareness that's, that is inseparable from compassion that we were talking about earlier, you know. It's almost like there's two kinds of awareness that we're talking about, that we need both in a way. Because just because you hear some teaching doesn't mean you're immediately going to realize it and be able to operate out of it for every moment of the rest of your life, you know. I found that very often in, in, in some spiritual paths and some spiritual teachers, not, not, not Buddhist, you know, it's kind of why I want, ended up with Buddhism. That people would go hear somebody talk and it kind of agrees with they with with what they already think that you're okay and that everything's fine and that you should just accept yourself and be which is all good stuff i'm not saying to reject yourself but we have a lot of work to do i mean i certainly do a massive amount you know when you really start to look at these teachings um So we need that logical awareness to figure out, well, what should I be doing and what shouldn't I be doing? Why should I meditate? Should I meditate? Should I read this Buddhist teaching? Should I go listen to this Buddhist teacher talk? Why? You know, we need that before we get to, you know, start to kind of even, even understand that there's another level of awareness, like Khandra Rinpoche was talking about this morning. Hope that's clear. You mentioned how volunteering to help a homeless man is to intellectualize compassion. What might non-intellectualized compassion look like? I don't know. That's a really good question. It might look like someone who um, is kind to someone that everybody else might hate, like a rich person who's, you know, white and male and straight and, you know, the type of person that liberals like to just demonize or something like that, <laughs> myself included, somebody in power like that, you know, making decisions or things like that. And someone who has a non-conceptualized, even now we're talking about con concept because we're talking about their qualities and I'm looking at their qualities, but I'm, um, they may, that, that, that non-intellectualized compassionate person might very well volunteer to help that homeless person. I'm not saying they wouldn't, I'm not saying that that action is even wrong. I'm just saying we have to understand that until we, you know, we have to crawl before we can fly, you know. When you, if you ever have the benefit to, um, to really be in the presence of, of you know, uh, of a teacher, you know, of a being that's actually cultivated these things, and realize these things every action almost every uh thing they say everything they do is geared toward the benefit of all beings uh, i'm biased i see that in my own teacher you know everything he does and every decision he makes and every it's like this fountain of you know of love and compassion because he realizes that you know just by the nature of us being human beings that we're all, you know, uh, that we are all subject to suffering in, in samsara, you know. He's not just, you know, doing this for the benefit of needy individuals or disadvantaged individuals, you know, he, he sees all of us, all, all who exist in samsara as needy and disadvantaged. What does your daily meditation practice look like? Uh, usually it's in the morning. Uh, usually if it's in the same place. Uh, and it's usually anywhere from between uh, 20 minutes to an hour, to be honest. 
there's different things that I do that, you know, uh, but, that my teacher has given me to do that, you know, I, I don't really see a need in sharing because they, they there's specific things that when you do study with a teacher, we take refuge in with a teacher that they give you specific practices to do. That's basically it. And uh, and there's days when I, I, I don't meditate for whatever reason, scheduling or illness or whatever. Uh, don't beat yourself up for that. But, you know, that's the daily meditation formal practice. But really what, what, what's as important is during the course of our day to settle into that practice, you know, to settle into that mind of meditation, that mind of like, you know, not just caught up in the moment of what's going on. You know, I have to get from point A to B. I have to deal with this person, you know, trying to find that spaciousness in our daily life. How can we ensure that our compassion is coming from a place of awareness and not feeding ego? I don't know if we can ensure that, and I don't know if we're capable of that yet. That's what I'm saying. We have to crawl before we can, uh, before we can fly. Do you know what I mean? Um, for example, doing something good for someone else because it will make us feel good. At least at a minimum, you're doing good for someone else. If it makes you feel good and you feel that that's kind of coming from the ego, but at least at a minimum, you know, somebody's benefiting from it you know what i mean i spoke about this a little bit last week you know a couple of weeks ago saying about spiritual materialism and how we can use our spiritual practice to aggrandize ourselves and reify the ego and all these things like me being an actor and i'm teaching meditation and there's this thing of being this buddhist you know that i you know have a, a, a an attachment to it makes me special it makes it separates me from the pack of other people in my feet, whatever, you know what I mean? So maybe it's not so good for my ego, but at a minimum, at least some of you are, are benefiting from it, you know? So, and like I said before, we have to crawl first. Uh, I don't think we can ensure that our compassion is coming from a place of awareness at this point, you know, as, as beginners, as we are, you know, and not feeding the ego. Um, but it's important to know that that's a possibility that know that that's where we're going, you know, otherwise we'd never, we wouldn't talk about enlightenment, you know, we're, we're, none of us are enlightened, but uh, we do know that that is uh, a possibility for human beings, you know? So uh, we're not ensuring that our actions are coming from, it's like, kind of like you're saying, how can we ensure that our actions are coming from a place of enlightenment, not just feeding the ego? Well, we can't because we're not enlightened yet. Our awareness hasn't been cultivated to a level that we're just operating completely from it all the time. But we have to start somewhere. And congratulations for starting. That's a big deal. You know, there's a saying that says, even a room that has been dark for thousands of years, if you light a candle in that room, it becomes illuminated. The darkness of thousands of years is gone from that tiny flame. How long have you been in a Buddhist? I've been a Buddhist for about um, 15 years. If compassion is awareness rather than a state of mind, would it manifest in a desire to serve others? In other words, do you think as we develop awareness, compassion, we also develop a greater desire to give or serve, or is that desire always tied to the ego? I think I addressed that in the other uh, questions. You know? Um, like I said, Buddhist teachings can really di be dispelled to these, th distilled to those three things: do no harm, cultivate virtue, do good, and 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 tame the mind. So, doing good, even if doing good sometimes is tied to the ego, it's better to do good than not to do good, right? If people are benefiting from it, you know, we're all, we're kind of like saying, okay, we know that destination is. 2,000 miles away, and we're going to go on foot. We're not going to get there today. But we know that that de destination is there, so we know we have to walk n north by northwest to get to that destination. But just the fact that we're walking north by northwest doesn't, we're not at the destination, right? But we're not just sitting in place and uh, not undertaking the journey. 
not undertaking the journey is that's the real um suffering really you know I am new to meditation and cannot maintain the meditative pose due to injury or surgery. Are there any alternative positions? There are. You can use a chair. If you do use a chair, uh, try to keep the same thing with the hips and the knees, the hips either being even or above the knees. Try to keep your feet flat on the floor and try to keep your back straight. Whether or not you need support for your back, is, if you need support for your back, it's okay as long as the back is straight. If that doesn't work, I do know someone who meditates lying down uh, on their back uh, because of physical um, uh, injury and limitations. Um, that's possible too. So you're doing the exact same work with the breath and the thoughts and the, and the mind and the stillness and all that. You're doing it on your back. Uh, it's not recommended unless you really have no other alternative because it's very easy to fall asleep, basically. Um, but yeah, so you do what you can, you know. What role do you think nature being within nature has on awareness and being in our true natural state? Well... Certainly, being in nature can bring a certain meditative quality or quiet to the mind, but not necessarily. You know, you could bring all your neuroses and all your stuff, <laughs> you know, into nature. I mean, sometimes people think, oh, well, if I, if I just got away from everything, you know, they live in a busy world with difficult people and difficult relationships and difficult work and things like that. If I just get away from everything and go sit in nature, all these things would disappear. But then they realize that it's an, in, it's an inside job, you know. This work that we're doing here is an inside job. You know? um, I certainly think, you know, um, being in nature is certainly a balm of sorts and can be. But uh, I think it's dangerous to to think of it as the only way you can kind of progress in meditation or in, in these teachings and things like that. How do you measure spiritual growth in med meditation? Can you get good at meditating? I don't think you should try to measure spiritual growth. I don't think you should think of getting good at meditating. I don't think you should worry about those things. I think you should just keep doing it. You may start to notice good, positive people coming into your life a little bit more. You may not either. You may not. You may notice more negative people coming into your life. Uh, you may net notice more conflicts. Uh, it's hard. You, it, it's hard to really say. You know what what the measuring stick is, and I think that's the wrong ap approach and way to look at it. Um, because we're, we're such a, a result-oriented society. Um, if, you, if you have more desire to benefit others, maybe that's the best measure. My cat died and possibly as a result of my slow action on taking him to the vet, I feel guilty. Can meditation help me let go? Hmm, I don't know. I mean, if the guilt and sadness is really overwhelming you, you know, you may want to talk to somebody like a therapist, a psychiatrist or something like that, some kind of talk therapy. If it's really, really, really possessing you in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a rough way, you know. Um, you know, you also, you have to, uh, I would say to beyond meditation, you know, read read the, the words of the teachers of the buddha of the of the teachers that we talk about here
No, it's very hard to talk about this because, of course, you loved your cat and you feel guilty about it. But um, you can't change the past, obviously, but you can. Um, you can do something maybe uh, in maybe make a donation to the, uh, what is it, the ASPCA or PETA or some kind of organization that helps animals in the name of your cat with the intention of, uh, you know, helping animals. That might help you kind of create a certain uh, closure and forgiveness, you know. If you could have done better in the moment, you would have, you know, at the time, you also have to look at the whole picture of why, you know, you couldn't have done that and just make resolve that you won't. I mean, you've, con you know, if you've kind of confessed your action by talking about it today, but you can also just make resolve in the future that whatever limit limited you in the moment that you're going to, you know, learn from that and not do it and maybe make some donation or give of your time if you can't afford to make a donation to one of these agencies or places or something like that. Okay, thank you uh, for coming today. Thank you, Nick Salidi, our producer, for his kindness and generosity in making this class possible. Let's dedicate the merit. Um, uh, and merit any merit that was generated by today's class would dedicate for the benefit of all beings. By this merit, may all beings attain the state of enlightenment and conquer the enemies of faults and delusions. May they be liberated from this ocean of samsara and its pounding waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. See you next week.